We have three very inspiring presentations there, three very different presentations, and um, I just realised how incompatible Tim is with Duncan. <laughs> um, that's about the most biggest contrast of... Um, Tim was just winching there whenever you, whenever you showed the next thing. So um, I'd like you to submit um, some questions on the app, please, if you'd like, and also via Twitter. Um, but I'll take our first question from anyone in the audience here. Got a lady down there? Have we got a microphone? Thanks very much. Um, I guess this is in first a question to Tim, but to, to all our panel, and thank you for some fantastic presentations, so inspiring. Um, with any long-term injury, there are ups and there are downs. What kept you going through some of the really bad days, the days when you woke up and it was constant pain, and how did you get through and how did you get to the next stage? Well, that was mainly my, my spine. I spent years of back pain. Um, I had serious back pain. I tried every single thing that you could do. It started off with doing um, osteo... Um, what I call I forgot what it's called now. Um, I went to the osteopath, rolled me up on a board, crunched my spine, I'd feel better. But it would last hours. Then I had intradiscal electrothermocoagulation, where they put needles into your spine, curl them up inside the disc and burn the discs out, trying to get the healing inside. I tried all those things, but the pain was just getting too much, and I just had to keep trying and finding a solution. And um, I said, look, I just cannot, because I used to come into a room like this, and the first thing I'd look for is where I could sit down, because I just could not stand. I can outstand anybody now. I can do plank for 40 minutes. <laughs> there are a lot of plates. I can do plank for 40 minutes on a, on a one-up, because my spine is just solid. But what, what, um, what, what kept me going through it, just, I do, just just got to keep trying different things. I just knew that I had to have something done and went for one of the longest um, spinal fusions that you'll come across. And actually, since that day, I mean, yes, it was a long operation. It was 14 hours of a solid operation. They had two doctors working on me. They fed them through tubes while they worked on me. I was on a, uh, um, a thing for pain that you press the button, but a morphine drip. And I kept pressing the button and it wouldn't give me any more, but because uh, it was a lot of pain. But actually, coming out the other side, I now am completely pain-free and it's the best thing I ever did. And I can do, I still ride my horse, I still go skiing, I used to do everything I shouldn't do, but I'm pain-free. There's nothing like being pain-free. So anybody that has a bad back, don't look, you know, just keep going. There are solutions out there. Okay, I think we'll take another question. Sorry for all that. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, Carla, uh, it's just a phenomenal story. I mean, Brazil's success of producing oil for the world is amazing, but goes unnoticed. How much longer do you think you can grow soya the way you are doing? How much longer? Uh, I mean, do you think you'll meet a plateau of total production, or do you think the fungicide resistance will become a problem? Um, uh, there are lots of research being done on that uh, uh, in order to uh, avoid this, uh, those kind of problems and also using those uh, technologies to detect where the plagues are more uh, concentrated <coughs> so we don't raise so much our cost that becomes inviolable to produce it. Also, we have, uh, still have lots of expansion of area, so I don't see soybeans uh, being... Uh, restricted the production in the uh, near future. Uh, and another reason for that is because the demand is still growing. As of everybody knows, uh, by 2050, there will be 9, million, uh, 9 billion people in the world so who is going and demanding for protein, for animal protein, which eats soybeans. So it's very needed. And the only place that we know uh, in the world that is able to attend to this uh, demand is Brazil. Okay, thank you. And um, we have a question um, on Twitter for Duncan. Um, Duncan, you seem to have created a strong brand. In Brexit Britain, we're all looking for a brand. What's your advice to stand out? <sighs> um, well, branding isn't my thing. <laughs> 
we went we went through quite an arduous process to get our brands. Um, you, with our brands, we just have to be true to everything that they are. Um, they have to mean something. Everything about us means it's filled with history, family, heritage, and you look at it, and that's what it means. Um, <coughs> so, yeah, it's probably not the best uh, answer I could give. Give me some time; I could come back with a better one. But uh, yeah. But do you think the family, you know, the, the strength of what we have as farmers is we have a family story behind our business, and you've intentionally you know, used the words Gigi's Yards and your granny is such an inspiration at 98 yeah. and everything that she's done in her life on the farm. So, you know, is that, that's behind your brand, really? Of course. And we, we looked at brands and we looked at names and we, you, you know, we ended up taking our brands to design companies and they said, don't touch it, it's perfect. Just use it the way it is. It's filled with, with personal attributes and heritage and provenance. Um, and that's what we've gone with. And some people said, oh, it's not right for print material and it's not right for visual displays, but, but it's, it's doing the job for us. Okay. Yeah. I'll just take another one from the app um, for Carla. Um, what kind of levels of government support to farmers are there in Brazilian agriculture and how much are you encouraged to make moves like yours into new territories? Um. Brazilian government isn't much interested in supporting anyone or they we have very corruptive uh, government um, we have some kind of uh, support to build the storage the the warehouses but it's very difficult to get you have to have lots of uh, guarantees in land so we don't if you don't have land it's very hard to get loans to build your infrastructure Besides that, we don't have any subsidies. We do have to pay lots of taxes, very high prices for, pri for freight. So the only way that we can keep doing agriculture is being very, very efficient. Okay, thank you. I'll take question five, number five, please. Uh, David Laurie, Scottish Young Farmers. It's a question for uh, Duncan. Duncan, you mentioned a little bit about succession there. Uh, just a wee bit more information on that, really. Was that purely just a conversation or was it sitting down, writing things down? Did you have anyone independent helping you with that? Just a bit more interest in that. Uh, yeah, it was an amazing process because uh, we did it as part of our Agritourism Monitor Farm project. And we rang, Caroline rang, and other people rang other farmers to ask them if they would come to a meeting with us about succession. And out of the 50 people that phoned, we managed to get five to come to the meeting. Five others uh, cried on the phone where the word was mentioned. And there was another 20, 25 who just said they strictly would not come because they didn't want to discuss it. Um, it took my father a few months to come round to the idea that by splitting our businesses three ways, it could be done fairly. His fear was that the farm, which has been at the core of our business since 1911, would then lose out, that we'd split it up and my brother would lose land. But the way we've done it, um, we, we still have 10 acres. You know, we own more, but my brother farms as much of it as he wants for as long as he wants. And if we have a field that we want to turn into snugs or lodges, then we speak to him and we give him a year's notice and we do that. So the process we went through, Dad said, yeah, I'm up for this. We all agreed it. We had an amazing lady called Shan Bushel who came and she facilitated it. Normally when she facilitates succession meetings, one family are in one room and another are in another and she walks between rooms. But it was very open and honest and she said, what are your hopes for this process and what are your worries for this process and we just, just sat like adults and talked about them and by the end of that she wrote a report and then the next day we had this public meeting and my dad reported back to everyone in the room and my dad's <coughs> a guy who has never shown emotion in his life uh, and he just started crying when he was getting back to the room it was you know it, it means it's such a delicate subject but you know if, if my kids when they were 20 turn around and says right now is the time and and we believed it was, I hope that I would be as open to change as, as my parents and grandparents have been. Yeah, I think it's, it's fair to say that, um, you know, your family have um, tackled succession while you were all getting on. And I think yeah. um, when Sharm was brought in, um, she said most of the people that she's dealing with is, is when the car crash has happened and um, family relationships have really broken down. Um, so... 
um, take my hat off to you guys for... And the beauty of doing it when we did it was that uh, I was in the adventure business and my other brother was farming, my other brother had a holiday business and, and it was just right. There was no point in myself and Vicky driving our business forward to in 30 or 40 years time, go right, let's split it up. Uh, and you know, and our value being huge because of the risks and the, the time that we'd put into it. Uh, and as it turned out, you know, we looked at it financially on paper and it, and it worked out perfectly. Okay, you always argue about the last 10 grand, but you know, it, 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 was, it was a simple process, yeah. Okay, we've got a question for Tim from the app. Um, Tim, do you have more ambition now than you had before? Because you've had this second more, chance at life. More ambition? Um, no, I don't think I've got more ambition. I'm very ambitious anyway. I'm very resilient and passionate, and I don't think I've changed a lot, to be honest with you. I don't think, no, I wouldn't say I've got more ambition. I'm still ambitious. Okay. We've got time for one more question. This lady down here. Thank you, uh, Emma Kelcher. Um, three really inspiring presentations from you all. Well done. Tim, from your point of view, a new employer comes on your farm. What would be the top tip for health and safety? Oh, the top tip for health and safety. Um, to know what's going on, really, you've got to actually look at the business and, and see what needs to happen. And that, you can do it yourself. As I said, you can employ someone to do it. But it's actually having the eyes and going around your business and seeing where there are potential problems and recording them and doing something about them. Because every farm has got an issue somewhere. I bet I could go on anybody, any room here and find some issue at some farm somewhere. And it's about knowing what they are and recording them. Do it yourself or get someone in to do it. Stephen's winking at me, so I'll just t t stop with the last question with Stephen. Uh, Stephen Fell. Duncan, um, if you um, ever want Sir Jim Pace to open your next adventure, give me a ring, <laughs> OK? Um, <laughs> um, doing risk assessments will seem really easy at home compared with what you have to go through with something I thought of. But I was looking at the number of people you employ, and I wonder if you could just tell us how you recruit them and how you reward them. Because you're not in an area of high density of people, are you? No, that's right. So um, before we launched our venue, we started recruitment process in uh, August. By that time, we already had 40 weddings booked. We were still building. Um, and at the end of the recruitment process, we had six applicants for 35 jobs. Uh, so we kept a brave face and we went to local schools and we presented to them. The recruitment process has changed quite a bit. Where in the past, you put a notice, job notice out and people would knock your door down to get the work. We had to go and beg people and present ourselves to them for them to decide whether we were the right people to work for. Uh, so it's really, it's really tough. Uh, but we've ended up with an amazing team, as you saw on the, on the uh, slides. We've got, uh, in peak season, we've got 80 people that work with us. Uh, full-time there'll be 20 uh, and how do we reward them we try and allow our team to we give them something and we r allow them to run with it as much as they can and when they need support we're there to support them wherever possible uh, and when they do well we reward them we reward them financially we reward them we ro reward them with cuddles you know they come to ours for tea or we take them out for tea and we have parties in our new venue and that was a dangerous one. Christmas party with a free bar. Oh, it stopped at 10. Um, but, you know... It only started at quarter to 10. Quarter to 10, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we, our door is open to any of them. We, we are out in there cleaning loose with them all. They, they have, uh, and we think, we're pretty sure they have quite a lot of respect for us. But, uh, yeah, finan you financial need. apply for a job, Stephen? Yeah. Not a problem. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd just like to thank our three speakers um, a great deal. They were very different presentations and I'm sure you'll agree, very inspiring. Um, and also like to thank the sponsors of this session, HDB. Thank you very much.